talk about uh, some of the characteristics of clouds, and I'm going to get into the specifics of CloudStack, what it offers, what it does, a couple of the tools that you can work with, uh, both to use CloudStack and to uh, explore CloudStack if you don't know much about it. Uh, so there's a, you know, there's a lot of buzz around cloud right now, um, and frankly, a lot of times people just hear the buzzword, and I don't think they know what they're really uh, discussing. Uh, NIST has a really good definition of cloud, uh, which is on-demand self-service. Uh, basically, you need to be able to plop down a credit card, or when you're talking about private cloud, you need to be able to plop down your credentials and have service right then. If it takes a week to provision, it's not cloud, okay? Um, broad network access, if you can't get to it over the network, it's really not cloud. Uh, resource pooling. Basically, your storage, your network, your compute, these are being you know, pooled and distributed among a lot of different users or departments or companies, depending on you know, what you're talking about. Rapid elasticity, if I can't spin up 1,000 or 100 VMs in 15, 20 minutes, we're really not talking about cloud. Measured service, if I can't bill you at the end of the month or if you're in a private cloud situation, if I can't do a chargeback at the end of the month, if I can't tell you how much you've used, again, we're not talking about cloud. Those five are the NIST definition of cloud. The sixth one, which I added, is API access. If it doesn't have an API, if you have to click, 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 click your way through something, it isn't cloud, okay? Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on this. Is anybody unclear, as Jeff was talking about the uh, stick a letter in front of AAS? Anybody unclear on these things? Anybody not familiar with the different types of clouds? So what I'm talking about today is infrastructure as a service cloud, not PaaS or SaaS. I'm also not going to talk a lot about deployment models. Is anybody confused about hybrid or private or public clouds? Okay. So I don't think I need to spend much time on this one either. Is anybody unconvinced about open source in the room? <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, you know, I, I do the presentation for a bunch of different groups, and sometimes you talk to people who aren't really sure that open source is that important. Uh, I think it is. Uh, you know, you're going to be hearing from people today talking about OpenStack. Is there Yuka? Is there any Yuka talks today? Okay. Um, but there's, you know, there's OpenStack, there's Yuka, there's CloudStack, there's Open Nebula for our friends in Europe. Um, you know, all these, as far as I'm concerned, are great. It's open source cloud. The things that I worry about that I don't want to see become the only options are things like VMware or Amazon Web Services. Not that there's anything wrong with AWS, but I don't want it to be the only option. So, all right, let's talk about CloudStack. Um, first, I want to talk about how we got to Apache. Um, how many folks are aware CloudStack is an Apache project? Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, CloudStack has a long history. A lot of people's first um, introduction to CloudStack was actually last year when they decided to try to make it a, a, a patchy project. Uh, it's actually been around since 2008-2007 as a startup called VMOps. Uh, it was then released under GPL v3 in May of 2010. Uh, Cloud.com was acquired by Citrix in 2011. Uh, and then made entirely open source in August uh, 2011. That, by the way, is a really fun story, and if you run into my colleague David Nally, I, invite, I would uh, invite you to buy him a beverage and ask him to tell you about it. I won't go into it here, but it's a fun little story. And uh, you'd be amazed at some of the corporate decisions that are made very informally by one person. Um, Relicensed and proposed to Apache, a lot of people were coming to us and saying, you know, we like CloudStack, we have some problems with the governance, we have some problems with GPL v3. Uh, they heard that and they basically donated it to Apache, uh, was accepted as an incubating project in April and we had our first uh, major release in November of last year. Uh, if the vote goes well, we'll have our first point release in about a week. <laughs> um, point, point of advice, when somebody says, hey, would anybody like to be a release manager for the point releases? Do not raise your hand. You just kind of look around and wait for somebody else to do it. Um, guess who raised their hand? Um, all right. So why Apache? Um, governance model, very well known. Companies are very comfortable with Apache, not so comfortable with uh, other governance models. 
Uh, you know, Apache has been around for a very long time and has shepherded a number of very successful projects and a lot of developers in the Apache community. So now, we are finally talking about Apache Cloud Stack. It's only taken me nine minutes. Um, so what is it? Open source infrastructure as a service supports multiple hypervisors, high availability, complex networking, firewall, load balancer, all sorts of good stuff, VPN configurations in a multi-tenant environment. So what is it really? Set of applications that provide separation between tenants. Handles allocating your compute resources, lets users provision things themselves, manages high availability, um, massively scalable. We have customers, or I should say Citrix has customers using cloud platform, cloud stack in production with upwards of 30,000 physical nodes. Okay, so it scales. Uh, resource usage accounting, we provide the accounting, though not the actual billing software. You have to get that from a third party or plop everything into Excel or uh, LibreOffice or whatever and uh, work up your accounting on your own. Um, one of the nice things about CloudStack is the UI. Uh, I like to describe it as beautiful, like a kitten riding a unicorn over a rainbow. Um, this is not actually the CloudStack UI, by the way. Um, but it's important that we have one. Uh, it's a reference implementation of the API. There's nothing you can do via the, via the uh, UI that you can't do with the API. And in fact, there are some things you can do with the API you can't really do through the UI easily, such as launch multiple VMs really easily. Um, built with HTML, CSS, and jQuery, uses JSP for localization. And we have people who do all kinds of customization to the UI. We have some people who have rewritten it entirely and offering you know, private or public clouds um, with their own implementation of the UI. We have other folks who have just basically reskinned it and put their company's logo on it or somewhere in between. This is just one screenshot um, from the API or from the UI. No actual kittens or unicorns. Um, this is some of the stuff that you can do. We have documentation on how you can reskin everything. Um, this is sort of a representation of everything that's in CloudStack. Uh, we have the API, both the native API and EC2 and uh, CS, um, I'm sorry. Uh, the CloudStack API and the EC2 S3 API, Amazon um, translation layer. Uh, there's a self-service portal, metering, dashboard, image management, all these good things. Basically, a lot of people ask me, you know, what's the difference between CloudStack and OpenStack? Uh, the biggest difference, aside from one's written in Java, one's in Python, different governance structures, things like that, OpenStack has a series of projects that you assemble or you get a distribution from a company uh, that put together all the components you need or some of the components you want to run infrastructure as a service cloud. Um, CloudStack is opinionated and productized. It's basically everything that we think somebody would need to run an IIS cloud in one component. You install CloudStack, boom, you have all the pieces in one area. Uh, real quick, any questions so far? Is everyone still awake? I know I saw a lot of, I saw all the cookies are gone, so I figure at least 10 of you are in a sugar coma as we speak. Um, yeah, it balances out, right? Yeah. One cookie, one cup of coffee. One cookie, one cup of coffee. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the basic architecture of CloudStack. So you need a management server which stores all of its information in a MySQL database. Um, anybody have an idea what happens if our management server falls over? What happens to all the VMs that are running? Exactly. Yes. Uh, the management server can puke all over itself and it's fine. All the VMs, the networking, everything stays up. Everything keeps working. Now, you can't use the API or manage it easily, but if that particular component falls over, you're fine. Um, then you have zones, pods, clusters, primary storage, secondary storage, and I'll talk about all that in a second. Uh, hypervisor support. We support KVM, uh, Zen servers in cloud platform, VMware via vCenter, and bare metal if you have IPMI. So you can use a number of different modes uh, or mix and match. You don't have to have all of one or the other. You can use, uh, for example, I live in St. Louis. There's a public cloud provider there called Contigix, and they offer a cloud 
with VMware, KVM, or Zen, depending on how much you want to pay. So if you want to go premium, you pay for the VMware and you get that. If you want to go cheap, you go KVM. Um, let's talk about zones. So basically, folks are familiar with AWS regions, right? Yes, okay. Um, so zones are very similar in cloud stack. It's basically, it's usually a geographic location. Uh, it shares secondary storage across the entire zone and you have a single network model for the entire zone. We support a couple different network models in CloudStack, and I'll talk about networking in a little bit. Uh, pod is sort of just a logical container um, for a rack or a row of racks, uh, shares a guest network among the pod. A cluster in CloudStack, they all have to be the same machine type, they all have to have the same hypervisor, um, usually a maximum of about 15 machines, depending on the hypervisor. Um, we're working on upping that, I believe, with 4.1.0. Um, but basically, everything in that has to be the same. You can't have, you know, five servers with uh, 24 gigs of RAM and five servers with 32 and different CPUs, things like that. Reason for that being, uh, in the cluster is where you're going to be moving, you can migrate VMs back and forth, and they have to all expect the same type of hypervisor, the same type of uh, resources. Uh, primary storage in a cluster, is, you know, it's, let me back up. Uh, the cluster shares primary storage, and I'll talk about what primary and secondary are here in a sec. Uh, so secondary storage is where you store your ISOs, uh, snapshots, templates, and everything. I believe the analog in OpenStack is Glance. Is that right? Um, historically has been NFS, but we're adding support for Gluster, Ceph, and some other ones in various stages. Um, and it's managed by a secondary storage VM, which is a guest VM that runs in the cluster that basically handles shuttling your images back and forth and managing all of that. Uh, manages your snapshots and all that good stuff. Again, this is all basically plopped in when you install CloudStack. So no, you know, no separate setup required. Uh, primary storage supports NFS, iSCSI, uh, CLVM, requires a uh, shared mount point for all of the hypervisors to talk to, uh, and can use local storage, um, sorry, primary storage can use local, but then there's no high availability, there's no migration. Uh, for some customers, for some users that need really, really high performance in certain workloads, this is great. I don't recommend it for most, most workloads, because if a host falls over, there goes your VMs. Um, any questions? Management server, uh, we already covered this a little bit. API, UI, stateless, all functionality is available via API. Um, basically, you can set it up to do unauthenticated uh, API access for testing on the local host, but not, I don't recommend this for production. Uh, authenticated is on 8080, uh, and you can get responses in XML or JSON. Uh, cloud stack allocation. Uh, I usually get questions about how does cloud stack decide where it's going to put VMs. Uh, the answer is basically you tell it what you want. So for some, you know, if you're energy conscious and you want to fill up servers before you turn on another one, you can do first fit. Uh, you can also, uh, you can do, or I'm sorry, you can do fill first. You can do first fit, basically pick the first host that responds and go with that. Um, you can do dispersions so that you can spread out your workload, whatever you want to do. If you don't like any of the ones that are available with CloudStack, you can write your own. Uh, you can do over-provisioning, and you can also do, you know, allocation by OS preference. High availability is not really high availability. It's, uh, you know, the marketing folks like to talk about high availability. It's really, really fast mean time to recovery. Uh, so basically, VM falls over, CloudStack goes, ah, damn, and spins another one up, okay? Uh, but it does not have a second VM sitting there waiting like, you know, heartbeat to take over, okay? Um, so it is not a magical HA solution. The idea for CloudStack really is that people use CloudStack like cloud, and they write applications so that they, you know, spill out rather than up. So it doesn't matter so much if an independent instance falls over. Yeah. Yeah. 
running off of persistent storage. Sorry, yeah, it can spin up the same one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, as, yeah, thanks for that. Um, any other questions? Uh, should be, yes. Uh, yeah. It's back to some of the slides when you talked about the management server falling over. Um, so what happens when you get your management server back up again? Um, are your instances that are currently running manageable? Is there a max for those instances? Yes. Yeah, yeah, no. The instances are still manageable. It's just a matter of, you know, you're not losing anything when it falls over. So. Uh, and a lot of people set up redundant management servers, so that's not a problem. So if one piece of hardware just dies, you know, it's not an issue. But if you just have one management server, you know, you're still covered. Did I see another hand or just folks waving themselves or fanning? Okay. Um, networking. Uh, basically, CloudStack manages all this stuff for you, DHCP, VLANs. Uh, firewall, NAT, routing, VPN, all that good stuff. We can also work with um, physical network hardware. Um, so F5, Big IP, NetScaler, Juniper, SRX. These things, unfortunately, I have to talk about uh, more from a hypothetical perspective because for some odd reason, Citrix is not willing to buy me all of this equipment to use at home. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, networking types. We offer basic and advanced networking. Uh, basically, you have your basic networking, which is really easy, um, advanced for more complicated setups. Um, and then we have several networks. There we go. Uh, we have several networks that are used by CloudStack to communicate. So basically a management network, private network for uh, system VMs to speak over, public network facing the internet, or you know, whatever, and a guest network where network VMs are provisioned on um, and so forth. You can have these all on one physical network or you can, you know, if you have a really uh, redundant and complicated setup, you can have each of these on different physical interfaces and so forth. Security groups uh, for folks that don't want to depend on VLANs, um, basically, you can use security groups, layer three isolation, very similar to what Amazon has. Um, so you have to assume a quasi-trusted layer two network. All the filtering and isolation happens at the bridge. Uh, the fault is, of course, deny all traffic. Any questions on this? Yeah. Um, I think that's in the works. Yeah. Usage accounting, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but basically provides all the stats and um, you know, information you would need for billing and whatnot. Um, shows the VM count, CPU usage, disk allocation, all of that good stuff. Um, there are integration how-tos for basically using all this data with like Excel or Amaya, Ubersmith, uh, Cloud Portal, which is a Citrix product. Any questions on, yeah? Uh, it gets information from whatever happens on our side. So where, wherever we make a call to those things, that's where the usage accounting comes from. So, any other, yeah. Um, I mean, basically that depends on your setup. Uh, I have not done this stuff, you know, I have not done that personally. Uh, I know we have, you know, we have users that are doing it. Um, but most of the, most of it so far is set up in, in single instances, but I know, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's basically dependent on your set of norm, normal operations, yeah. Uh, it probably stops collecting usage accounting at that point, yeah. Okay. Um, but it's not, when I talk about the management server go down, I, I should mention this is not like an everyday occurrence or whatever, you know. Um, at least I hope not. Any other questions? All right. Uh, real quick, wanted to talk about the uh, EC2 configuration because I know a lot of folks are using AWS and might want to use this for dev testing or something. Um, 
We do provide an EC2 compatible interface. Uh, it used to be a separate, when Citrix was, was running the project, it was a separate thing, I believe it's called CloudBridge. You basically had to install this. It wasn't particularly onerous, but you had to set it up on your own. Uh, it is now rolled into Apache Cloud Stack incubating. Um, SOAP and REST interface. Um, REST interface is under heavy development. I think it's pretty stable at this point. Uh, this is a slightly old slide. Uh, it's pretty easy to drop this in. Basically, you can go into the global configuration, you register the API keys, uh, do the certificate and all that stuff, uh, set up the environment variables, set up your Amazon, your matching uh, instance types, and I'll walk through this a little bit in the slides here. Uh, but it takes all of about five to 10 minutes um, following the documentation the first time. Um, so basically, by the way, I imported these slides into uh, LibreOffice from PowerPoint, and it's done some amazingly weird things to the slides. Um, but basically, one way to do this is in the GUI. You just click over and toggle a few bits, and you're done. Uh, the other way to do it is via an API call. Um, again, all very simple stuff to do. Generate your keys, again, via the GUI or via the API. Um, Register your user. Provide the Amazon instance types. So basically you want an instance type that matches like the Amazon offerings like M1 small or whatever. Um, set up your shell environment. Um, you can use Bodo with this. Um, by the way, these slides, uh, Tim, is there like a, are you gonna have these slides collected somewhere or just put them up on SlideShare? Okay, I'll, I'll send those to you. That's usually the first question I get, by the way. I'm, I'm pleased that that wasn't the first question I got here. It's usually, are the slides gonna be up somewhere? Um, so anyway, so you can walk through the Boto example here. Um, if you don't wanna set up, so generally speaking, CloudStack requires at least two nodes to work with. Um, if you don't happen to have two physical servers spare, uh, or just don't feel like going through all that, uh, there is a developer testing environment called DevCloud. Uh, right now works in uh, VirtualBox and there's another project underway to make it work under KVM. Uh, so basically you can set up a single node with KVM and, and set everything up within it. Um, but you can grab the DevCloud image, boot it up in uh, VirtualBox and you're good. Um, so yeah, if you have any problems with that, this is under very heavy development. Um, CloudStack, when we went over to Apache, there was a lot of work to get from the Citrix development environment into Apache. A lot of people looked around and said, you know, we don't like building with Ant. Let's try Maven. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of work to go that way. Uh, and so what we did for DevCloud six months ago is very different from what we're doing now, and it's still under pretty heavy development heading to 4.1.0. Um, let's just ignore that. Uh, there's also some Python management tools. Um, there's CloudMonkey, uh, which is uh, kind of new with this release, uh, but it's a command line environment working with uh, CloudStack. Uh, Jason Hancock has also created a CloudStack client, uh, which is still a little bit rough, but worth working with. This is kind of a basic example of just spinning up some stuff in that. Any other questions before I before I move on. Going once. Yeah. The multicast support in the network um, functionality in the network. What about? Uh, it's a good question, I don't know. Um, I know we don't, we are working on IPv6 multicast, I'm not sure, so, yeah. Uh, no, no virtual box. KVM, Zen, and, and uh, VMware right now. Uh, none that I'm aware of. Uh, Patch is accepted. I know there's a lot of talk about Hyper-V, but nobody has actually, you know, there's been a lot of talk and a couple uh, functional specs, but I have not actually seen code drop for, for Hyper-V. Um, so, yeah. Image support. Any support for ODF or OVA support? Uh, it depends on the hypervisor. So it's not really through, if your hypervisor supports it, then we can work with it. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. I'm sorry, say again? So, uh, we have the different network types up before, such as management, the, uh, like the public networks. Uh, I think they're all in one uh, sort of hub where can you do cross for it, as in uh, give priority to uh, certain network types? Such a, oh, so like giving priority to HTTP or something like that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I believe you can do that. So, any other questions? Yeah. I'm sorry? Is it a long standard to define Yes. Yeah. Uh, within reason. No, it's it's in the database. It's not going to go and poll everything. Failure of uh, that is basically you need to if if you're worried about that you're going to need to have yeah yeah sorry <laughs> yeah back in the red shirt. I'm sorry, say again? Security policies. Is there anyone on your team responsible for writing up and checking for team security for OpenStack? For CloudStack? Uh, so, is there, so do we have a security, you mean like for the Apache project? Uh, not currently. Apache has its own security project. We do not have like a specific security team at the moment. There's been some discussion about it, but it hasn't gotten off the ground. Um, it's a good question. Um, Anybody else? Yeah, back there. What do you lose in the S3 API? Um, so basically, all we're trying to do with the S3 API is provide compatibility with what you've got at Amazon. Um, there is obviously a lot more functionality that's available via our API. Anything you can do with CloudStack that isn't available in S3 or EC2, basically. So I don't have a specific list of features, but but yeah. Uh, and so our in our, you know, there's no way for us to put into the EC2 or S3 API things that aren't already there. Um, if I would also add, you know. Fidelity with that is, is one of our goals, but probably not as primary as, say, a project like Yuka. You know, so. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, OpenStack has, like, really, really broad community backing, where that community is not just users, but also um, uh, companies basically throwing their weight behind this. Mm -hmm. For CloudStack, that seems to be a little reduced. Thoughts? Um, that sounds like a slightly leading question. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, so basically, um, how to answer that diplomatically? Uh, so, okay. So the first thing I would say is look at the actual contributor numbers for for OpenStack and actual Git commits uh, versus the number of companies that say they are committers for OpenStack. Uh, because OpenStack claims something like 200 plus companies, the actual commits are less uh, when you size them up by company. Um, the other thing I would say is, so we have a number of companies that are involved. It's an Apache project, so we don't count companies specifically. You know, we have a guy, for example, who works with a company called PC Extreme in the Netherlands. He is a committer He's actually a PPMC member as himself, not as PC Extreme. I am a committer and a PPMC member on my behalf, not for Citrix. Um, so it is less about, you know, specifically which company is backing it and more about the people that are involved in the actual trajectory of development. Uh, so, I mean, if you look at the actual development that's going on, 
we have a fair number of contributions coming from companies outside of Citrix and outside of just, um, now if you're talking about distributors, is your question based around who's distributing it as opposed to, oh. you asked about users. Mm -hmm. Whether or not they're actively contributing is rather secondary. Um, I'm not sure that's true. I mean, what good does it do to say I'm supporting this when you don't do anything? It's easy to sign on to a marketing effort. It's significantly harder to actually contribute. Well, if, if I may say so, if you're thinking that actually contributing code is the only way that you can contribute, I would say that. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there's probably a lot of, hey, that looks like a great bandwagon to be on. Uh, sign us up. So, any other questions? Uh, yeah. Is there a contributor agreement for Yeah, it's the it's standard Apache contributor agreement. So, uh, either a CCLA if you're contributing on behalf of a company or ICLA if you're contributing on your own behalf. Do you find that that's common for general? I'm sorry? I have not seen it. I mean, it's, um, no, uh, not, not so far. Is there not a CLA for OpenStack or for other projects? Uh, there's not for staff. I don't know about OpenStack. There, no. there, there is a CLA. It does not include uh, copyright side numbers. OK. So it just basically states that, yes, you're, you're capable of making this contribution. OK. Yeah, I, I don't think that's dissimilar to what Apache is, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Could be. I don't have it memorized. It's not. Uh, it wasn't a huge concern for me. So. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Um. It's. I'm sorry. Can't be moved. Um, well, I, you know, it's code. Anything could be removed, but um, as as far as I know, we don't have any plans to remove it. We plan to support it in a, you know, in the long term. Um, so yeah, why why do you ask? Okay, um, we we do not have a problem with having it in there. That's I'll put it that way. Yeah, people. Yeah. Um, yeah, as far as I know, there's not anyone contributing or using it that really has a gripe with that on our end. Um, yeah? How hard is it to migrate from one manager to release? It should not be hard. It should not be terribly hard. Te upgrade testing is one of the things we really focus on. Uh, basically, you upgrade the management server and you point at it and you're done. It's, it's not particular. it's mostly like if you're on, you could either do a code up, you know, if you're doing just built from source, you can do an upgrade that way, or you can just install a couple of RPMs or a couple Debian packages and you're done. It's, um, well, with Zen server or, or vSphere, there is none. Uh, with KVM, there is an agent that might need to be upgraded, uh, but that's it, so. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Support rolling upgrades, as in um, this many nodes in the old version, this many nodes in the new version, while we're upgrading, and is that is that cloud supposed to function? Uh, yeah. That should be yeah. Um, yes, sir. Back there. Uh, so you have multiple management servers. Yes. Uh, no, what you would do is you would basically take, so you can take a snapshot, you can make a template of one, and you can move that, but you don't move, you don't migrate between clusters. So. Uh huh. You cannot split, a, you cannot split a cluster across two data centers, but you could do a, a, a zone. So. Any other questions? Yeah. No, 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 no. Those are very different things. Yeah, basically, yeah, no, those are very different. So, any other questions? Are we, hang on just a second. How am I doing on time? Am I getting, 
Huh? Okay. I just want to make sure I'm not cutting into anybody else. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, say again. Not that I'm aware of. Um, I haven't, I have not seen a functional spec or, or anything for 4.1 on that now. Um, now if you, yeah, no. Is it difficult to, to do that kind of work? Um, well, it would be difficult for me because I'm not a developer, but um, I, I, it didn't take very long to add, for example, uh, Ceph RDB support and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. Sorry? As far as I know, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, sir? I'm sorry, say again? Yes. Uh, it depends on which networking setup you're using, whether you're using the security groups or VLANs. Um, so it's basically you're kind of defining some of that, but it does support it. So, other questions? Yeah, in the red shirt. Uh, so currently, we're not packaged in Debian. We have somebody who's doing Debian packages, but we're not currently in Debian. Uh, it's there's not a current roadmap. It's being discussed, but basically, it's we've got to figure out. Um, getting the bandwidth to get into the distributions or finding people in the distributions that want to pick it up. So, but right now it's basically as simple as adding, you know, a package repository and grabbing. So, uh, yeah. Sorry, where? Uh, no, it's up. It's up with stable, so we don't currently not up with um, with that now. So, yeah. How extensive is your automated test suite? Not as extensive as we would like, but pretty extensive. Uh, that's one of the things that has been worked on very, very hard. Yeah. Also following up with that. Yeah. Are you using um, gated commits, smoke tests, Garrett? Uh, we're using Jenkins right now. Basically, every time there's a commit, it starts running the tests and then building everything over again. So um, we would like to move, I think, eventually to Garrett, but we're not there yet. Um, we implemented, uh, we have review board up right now, which was one of those, one of the, one of the nice, one of the drawbacks to Apache is getting infrastructure up is not always trivial. Um, yeah, so way in the back. Yeah. Yes. So actually, um, there, I don't remember the specifics, but I do know there are some features we support, um, for example, in vSphere that, you know, aren't necessarily in KVM that are exposed. But generally, we do try to support a baseline across all the hypervisors. Um, it's, we also have a plug-in architecture, so it is not difficult to necessarily add support for something that isn't in the core. So you can expose features that way, too. Um, we're done? Okay. Thanks, folks. <laughs> I would like to add that was the most thorough grilling I've gotten so far on this presentation. It's great. <laughs> it's nice to know people are paying attention.